It's hard to hear somebody say, just hang in there and keep going, but I've lived it. And I can tell you that if you'll keep going, if you'll keep forward momentum and keep trying and keep picking yourself up, you will eventually get to where you're supposed to go. We all have those moments where we need a little encouragement to get through our day. Someone to remind us that we are not alone. Find peace. Embrace joy. Seek God daily. Welcome to Jesus Calling Stories of Faith. For two decades, Jay DeMarcus has been making country music with the award-winning group Rascal Flats. But his journey to the big stage was an unexpected one. Growing up in Ohio, Jay had no idea how to break into the music business. And when he moved to Nashville after sending in a demo tape, he discovered chasing his dream was a lot harder than turning it into reality. Jay reflects on his struggles and successes along the way, which he's written about as well in his new memoir, Shotgun Angels. I'm Jay DeMarcus, and I am one-third of Rascal Flats. Um, I do a lot of different things. I songwrite, I produce, I act a little bit when time permits, so I've got my hands in a lot of different things. Well, I grew up in Columbus, Ohio. My mother and dad were both musicians. They met when they were young. My dad's a few years older than my mother, but not by much. And uh, they met playing in clubs together, so um, they started the date and got married. Um, both playing in bars together and my mom would sing uh, praise and worship Sunday morning in church so I had kind of the best of both worlds growing up. My mother had a very very strong foundation her faith was really really strong she raised us in the church when we were there you know every time the doors were open we'd go to choir practice on Tuesday we'd go to Bible study on Wednesday twice on Sunday so it felt like a little bit of overkill for me sometimes but looking back now um, I realize how much it helped to shape me and my personal faith. Even in the times when I struggled with my faith, uh, the foundations and the, the roots were very, very deep. So I'm grateful that I had a mom that cared enough to really lay the groundwork for me for later on in life. My journey uh, to Nashville was really, really by chance. I was in my dorm room and I had uh, written some Christian songs. I'd grown up in the church, obviously, and been in a few different Christian bands. And I was really into bands like White Heart and Petra, and DeGarmo and Key and, and For Him and early pop Christian music really, really was fun for me. And I loved it. Michael W. Smith, Amy Grant. So I wrote in that vein of contemporary Christian. So I had my roommate at the time, Neil Coomer, was singing the demos that I would do. So I mailed these away to Nashville to all of the publishing companies that I could find. And um, I got a call one time in my dorm on the payphone that was in the hallway there. And it was from Don Cook uh, at Benson Records. And he said, I love your band. It's great, we'd like to talk to you more about cutting some stuff. And I had to explain to him that we weren't a band, that I had just done some demos and was trying to be a songwriter. Well, he said, you should go talk to your roommate and see if you guys want to do a band because I love the sound of what you guys are doing. Long story short, Neil and I, who was my roommate, uh, went to Nashville, met with Benson and decided to try it. We had no aspirations of being an act, but we got signed right on the spot pretty much. And my music career was taken off and already early signs of it not going exactly how I planned or thought I had it mapped out. And we were an act on Benson for about four and a half years. Um, some things happened in my life and some circumstances changed and we broke up after about four and a half years. And I was kind of for the first time lost. I didn't know what I was gonna do. I was living here and barely scraping by. It's tough to make it as a musician in this town. There were a lot of times that I felt like I had reached the end of my rope and I was broke. And I remember my part, apartment being broken into. All the gear that I had to make a living with was stolen. I didn't know how in the world I was gonna get another keyboard or another bass guitar to even make a living. And those were the times, those darkest times, were the times that I had to dig the deepest. And a lot of the times I'd pick the phone up and call my mom and I'd say, I gotta come back home. I've gotta get a job. I've chased this nonsense long enough. I've gotta throw in the towel and come back and get my life together and get a real job, do something that makes sense. And my mother would not 
let me come home. She kept pushing me and telling me that I was right where God wanted me to be and that I didn't need to let the enemy defeat me. I started to go back over my life and think about things that had happened to get me to this point. And it quickly became apparent to me that I had a really remarkable story to tell, not because of the person that I am, but because of the person that I serve. And the fact that he had his hand on me the entire time growing up through Colum in Columbus, Ohio, going on to high school and ending up in college that I never even had plans to go to because I didn't have any money. I grew up really, really poor. So when I look back over the things that had happened that were miraculous sometimes, even improbable, it started to dawn on me that I needed to tell my story for other people who might have been just like me, who don't know where to start, who are lost, who struggle, who uh, have dreams, but don't know how to start chasing them. And I think that as long as you keep your ears and your eyes and your heart open, you also can recognize those moments, those God moments, when he's nudging you in the direction you should go. For me, it was like a marquee sign on a church that I would pass, and it would just be enough of a little bit of a hope nugget to keep me going on. And those things, when I look back on my life, they happened all the time. And I didn't even really, sometimes it happened subconsciously, and it didn't even register until years later that that was just enough to keep me moving forward. And one thing led to another. I started hanging out in different circles with different musicians who were playing in clubs around town. Some of the best players this town has to offer, you could find them down on Broadway, Printer's Alley. And I loved it because I'd go in there and listen to these world-class musicians. And so my network and my circle started to get bigger and bigger. And then lo and behold, I ended up becoming the band leader for Shelley Wright. And that was a big step in the direction of heading into country music, which I loved anyway. I'd grown up with it. My mom was country music queen of Ohio in 1969, so I was surrounded by all kinds of different music, but really had a love for country. Early on in Rascal Flats, I remember we had just released the single, I'm Moving On, and it was uh, starting to pick up steam, and we were at a radio station doing an interview uh, like we'd done a million times, and we started to take phone calls into the studio, and there was a guy that called in, and he said, I have to tell you a story. He said, I'm a truck driver, and I spent a lot of time listening to the radio. My wife had left me. My life felt like it was falling apart, and I had determined that I was going to kill myself. And I heard your song, I'm Moving On, and I pulled my 18-wheeler off to the shoulder side of the road and broke down right there in tears. And he said, your song literally saved my life. And when you hear stories like that, and you know that you've been a part, just a small part, of helping somebody turn their life around and encouraging them that, you know, you don't need to give up, that there's always hope out there waiting around the corner. I want to be a part of things like that. And that's what keeps me doing what I'm doing. That's the greatest reward you could ever hope for as an artist. We'll be right back to learn about the legacy Jay is working to leave behind with Rascal Flats and beyond, right after this brief message about a beautiful new edition of Jesus Calling. Share his love. Share his inspiration. Share his strength. Share his joy. Jay's journey ultimately led him back to founding his own Christian music label. He talks about why this was meaningful to him and how he approaches life by making time for what's important. There were a lot of different things that led me to open up a Christian label, but my love for Christian music never uh, ceased even when I was in Rascal Flats. You know, I would still listen to it. And there's, there's just a difference in the message of that music that is so 
uh, encouraging to folks. You know, it offers hope and it puts a little bit of light into a really dark world. And every time I would do a little bit back in the Christian music genre, I would always feel like I was going back home a little bit to where it had all started. And there's this kind of pull that you feel, you know, there is, when you're making that music, it's different than making country music or rock music. There's, you know, the message is at the core of what it's trying to get across. And I just love that because I feel like any good that we can put back into this universe, any hope that we can provide for people that are hurting or going through seasons in their life where they're struggling, I wanna be a part of that. And so the more I did it, the more I felt like I kind of knew that world really well. I understood the artists that were trying to do the music and I wanted to give them a platform and a space to create. We've only got a few Christian labels in this town and it just started feeling to me like there was room for somebody else to come in and do things maybe a little bit differently than the majors have done them. So I wanted to give my artists um, a unique perspective in that I'm an artist so I have a good handle uh, of the knowledge of what they expect out of a record label. So that's what led me ultimately to opening up Red Street Records. Well, I think you have to be very deliberate about making time for everything that's important to you in your life. And obviously family is right at the top of that for me. Um, I have a wonderful wife who is very, very patient and very tolerant of the e extraordinary responsibilities that I have, and she's very supportive. But she has to remind me sometimes very gently, hey, you gotta take a deep breath. You gotta slow down for just a minute. You've opened up a label, you got a book coming out, you're getting ready to go on tour again. So tomorrow we're gonna leave, for instance, and take our, our family on a trip for a few days just to kind of unplug for a minute and decompress. And I think that that's as important as working hard is to make sure you take stock of what you've got right in front of you. And it's hard to do because I am a workaholic and I love to work, but um, I'm learning more and more how to get myself into a place to where I can go, you know what, I need to take a break for just a little bit. And it's a healthy thing too, I think. I do have um, a lot of tools that help me um, have quality one-on-one -on -one time with, with God. When I'm home off the road, I start every day by going to my office, my study, and I read a devotional. Sometimes it's from a book, sometimes it's Jesus Calling, sometimes it's Grace in the Moment by Max Lucado. I uh, discovered Jesus Calling a few years ago, a buddy of mine uh, that used to play tight end for the Cowboys in the 80s, Doug Cosby turned me on to it. And it's a very easy thing to have on your phone and access in those times when you only have a few minutes to get a quick devotional in. And the thing I love about Jesus Calling is I feel like he's speaking right to me when I'm reading it. And it's just a very unique way to experience um, a devotional, and that's what I really, really love about it. October 18th, go gently through this day, keeping your eyes on me. I will open up the way before you as you take steps of trust along your path. Sometimes the way before you appears to be blocked. If you focus on the obstacle or search for a way around it, you will probably go off course. Instead, focus on me, the shepherd who is leading you along your life journey. Before you know it, the obstacle will be behind you and you will hardly know how you pass through it. That is the secret of success in my kingdom. Although you remain aware of the visible world around you, your primary awareness is of me. When the road before you looks rocky, you can trust me to get you through the rough patch. My presence enables you to face each day with confidence. For me, the most important thing is, is that you can never allow yourself get to a place to where you're so deep in despair that you don't look for the hope that is there because it can be in the strangest places. It can be in things like a text message from a friend or somebody that just happens to call you to tell you they're thinking about you. And I'm not perfect about it by any means, but I try to be deliberate about thanking God for everything that I have and, and giving Him thanks and also praying for His guidance every day, praying for His wisdom that I'll make the best decisions for me and my family and my career and everything that's going on. But uh, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. It's hard and I know a lot of people struggle with it. So I wanted to just be an encouragement to people and hopefully in them taking a look at my life and the things that happened for me, the biggest message is if you'll do it for someone like me, 
who has failed miserably sometimes in my own life with making bad decisions and struggling with my faith. He'll do it for anyone. That's the bottom line. You can find Jay's new book, Shotgun Angels, wherever books are sold. Next time on Jesus Calling Stories of Faith, we talk with Dr. Henry Cloud and Dr. John Townsend. These two psychologists are best known for writing the blockbuster New York Times bestseller, Boundaries. Dr. Townsend speaks to the notion that in order to have good health, mental and physical, we need to have a healthy spiritual life. You know, spiritual life is really a critical part of this. And I think that sort of everything is spiritual because God made the world. So I think relationships are spiritual and I think our mission, our jobs are spiritual. But there's what I call the vertical aspect, which is clearly God, right? We've got to have that as well as all the other things we do. And it's so fundamental to following Him and having purpose and being the right kind of person. Thank you for watching Jesus Calling Stories of Faith. To learn more about how to keep up with our shows bi-monthly and to listen to our weekly podcast, please visit youtube.com slash Jesus Calling Book to view and hear previous episodes and to watch a short informational video about how to access all things Jesus Calling on audio and video formats. Plus, learn how to subscribe to our podcast and video channels. Your subscription helps get the word out to more people who will benefit from these inspirational stories of faith.